Hello and welcome to Revolutionary Socialist Review with Chris Driscoll and Rainer Shea. Today we have, uh, well, several uh, issues for you, but we're going to start off with the evictions. Um, this comes basic mainly from an article from, um, well, let me see here, where am I? Uh, comes from an article from the Workers' World, uh, the newspaper of the Workers' World Party. And um, they say that the moratorium on uh, evictions instituted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention expired on August 1st. Some relief was afforded when the CDC extended it for another two months, in, in other words, until the end of uh, September. However, on August 26th, just uh, not very many days ago, um, the Supreme Court uh, ruled by a three, uh, by a six to three majority that the CDC has exceeded its authority and the eviction moratorium was no longer enforceable. So we're back to square one, no eviction moratorium. And uh, a lot of people are scrambling, a lot of uh, landlords basically are scrambling to kick people out while they can. Um, a lot of families will end up uh, in the gutter or in the streets and um, no relief for them because we don't have the same kind of thing that they had in the 1930s when the Communist Party of America at that time, Communist Party USA, uh, no, it was Communist Party of America, I think at that time, um, ha had uh, all over the country had uh, uh, anti-eviction um, uh, 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 anti-eviction, uh, uh, what would you call it? Anti-eviction uh, groups that organized to, as soon as the people were evicted and thrown out onto the street, they just picked up all the property that the people had and moved it right back into the place. Um, very effective. Over time, uh, the uh, <laughs> the landlords uh, started uh, just uh, st steering clear and leaving the people alone. And that's what we need now. However, um, the uh, well, the, you know, there's some other relief, like the Congress is coming back and the uh, Supreme Court does recognize Congress's right uh, to uh, impose a new moratorium if it wants to. So we'll see where that, where that goes. But in the meantime, there's no moratorium and there's going to be a lot of people out on the streets because of it. Rainer? Well, that's... That puts things in perspective, doesn't it, in terms of uh, extent of our capitalist crisis? Uh, not even in the 1930s was it as bad as it is now, not nearly as bad, at least in terms of the uh, organizing institutions that are capable of uh, uh, solving the humanitarian fallout from these inevitable economic crises that capitalism produces. Uh, we're, we're in such a, a bad place right now. And uh, all that people like us can do is try our best to rebuild those institutions. Uh, and you, you could say that this, uh, this is a bleak sign given that, that even something like 80 years ago, 90 years ago, uh, far, uh, far more back in 
uh, these stages of our capitalist crises, the communist institutions in this, this country were actually a lot more strong. But the reality is that contradictions are intensifying in this country and around the world. And uh, proletarian revolution is becoming more of a practical necessity for the masses. Well put, well put. Next on the list, U.S. leaves chaos, destruction in Afghanistan. And th this comes to us from the Global Times. And the Global Times uh, says that, uh, that, that the, uh, basically that the uh, U.S. Uh, new beginning fraught with problems and uncertainties, they say. The U.S. Competed, completed the withdrawal of its forces from Afghanistan on Monday before the deadline. The deadline, of course, was yesterday. Um, the uh, officially ending 20 years of U.S.-led invasion in Afghanistan and war leaving the war-torn country with an uncertain future, leaving nothing but chaos and destruction in the country. The U.S. has meet, met triple debacles on counterterrorism, democratic reform, and global governance. And the military withdrawal should not be the end of responsibility, but the beginning of reflection for the U.S., analysts said on Tuesday. After uh, the massive but disorganized, humili hum humiliating withdrawal, a U.S.-built C-17 carrying the last American troops out of Afghanistan on Monday, marked, marking the final end to the long war in the U.S. Uh, while the co completion of the withdrawal ending the U.S. presence in Afghanistan uh, the diplomatic mission to ensure additional U.S. citizens and uh, eligible Afghans who want to leave continues. The commander, uh, Ka Kenneth M McKenzie, the commander of the U.S. Central Command, announced during a news conference held uh, by the Department of Defense on Monday. After 20 years of U.S. and Western troops occupation, Afghanistan has been turned, returned to its people. Reuters reported that celebratory fire echoed across uh, Kabul as Taliban fighters took control of the airport before dawn on Tuesday following the withdrawal of the last U.S. troops. Uh, Taliban spokesman Sahal Shaheen tweeted on Monday that tonight at 12 midnight, the last American soldier left Afghanistan. Our country gained full independence. However, with the exit of the US, the Western troops and the war-torn country is now facing bigger uncertainties with increased concerns over <clears throat> in which direction the, ta the Taliban, the Afghan Taliban will lead the country. And also a more important question needs to be answered. What the US left behind the country after, after the past 20 years? And the answer to that is nothing but chaos and destruction. Um, and then they go into uh, a, a long list of uh, uh, experts talking about what the US has left, which is really chaos. Um, one interesting figure here, in the 20 years since September 11, 2001, the U.S. has spent more than $2 trillion on the war in Afghanistan. That's $300 million every day, each and every day for two decades. There have been 2,500 U.S. military deaths in Afghanistan. That pales next to the estimated 69,000 Afghan mil military police and 47,000 civilians killed, according to data from Forbes, reported on August 16th. 
they go on and on, but uh, essentially they show a uh, country that is uh, that that is in deep trouble in every possible way, and that's what the U.S. left Afghanistan after 20 years of being there. They left in their wake a uh, huge amount of uh, defeat, and they and they will suffer because of that. The humiliating, the humiliation uh, throughout the world, around the world, for not having the ability even to uh, control one country that it has uh, invaded and uh, occupied. Uh, not, not even one of the countries, of the several countries it's invaded and occupied. Uh, the, the longest one, the one that they've spent 20 year, years there, not even there do they ha have the ability to do the, e the basic essentials of uh, governing in the place of a legitimate uh, uh, national government and of uh, taking the place of that national government. So uh, I, I, a, a huge US tobacco all the way around. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, a few weeks ago, I learned about the CIA death squads. Abby yeah. Martin talked about those, about how they carried out atrocities of such magnitude that it made the Taliban into the lesser evil. At least that's how the masses of Afghanistan have come to see the Taliban, because the reason why the Taliban uh, has been able to uh, outmaneuver the U.S. despite being uh, outmanned and outgunned is because of the help from these local communities that have been willing to assist the Taliban forces. The imperialists haven't been able to get the people on their side in spite of how their opponents are an ultra reactionary, extreme misogynist, homophobic organization that certainly does not care about building workers' democracy. Exactly, and that, as it turns out, is our next issue, uh, our next topic, the uh, CIA's shadow army in Afghanistan, which is death squads, basically. The uh, CIA, uh, 20 years ago, when the United States entered uh, Afghanistan, they uh, instituted a uh, they instituted a uh, uh, a kind of a um, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Here we go. Blowback. Taliban cradle of U.S. Uh, uh, Intel sa shadow army. This is an article from The Cradle, uh, and it's by Pepe Escobar, uh, August 27th. Um, so it's about a week old. Uh, and in the article, he, uh, Pepe Escobar, who we've mentioned several times in the past, he's a, he's a pretty damn good investigative reporter. Um, from Brazil originally. And he goes into uh, the CIA's establishment of a shadow army, uh, which is basically carried out the work of death squads. That's exactly what at least part of this, there are actually uh, two major components of this uh, uh, shadow army, and that's exactly what they did. They acted as death squads against anyone throughout the country of uh, Afghanistan who did not meet their uh, expectations or their uh, pro-imperialist, pro-U.S., pro-U.S. Uh, uh, invasion occupation of Afghanistan. So they ran into a lot of 
um, resistance, and it wasn't just the Taliban that they found that they uh, had resisting them. It was I mean, a, a large part of the country because a large part of the country did not like the idea of the U.S. invading and occupying their country. So uh, they got this article goes much deeper into um, uh, in into the uh, ways and means through which uh, through which the uh, CIA uh, established this shadow army, which includes about ten thousand uh, paid mercenaries. Um, in the main one and another, um, uh, another five to 10,000 uh, mercenaries and another one. The two uh, forces are called the Coast Protection Force and the National Directorate of Security. These, oper these operatives are the prime Taliban targets at checkpoints leading to the Taliban air airport not random helpless Afghan civilians trying to escape. Um, and these people, the Coast Protection Force and the National Directorate for Security are the two, basically the two arms of the CIA uh, set up with mercenary forces that the CIA up until quite recently paid to um, do their bidding in Afghanistan for 20 years and made Afghanistan into a living hell for the overwhelming majority of people there. Uh, the uh, Coast Protection Force and the National Directorate of Security now presumably are no longer being paid by the CIA because the CIA has been pulled out However, uh, well, who knows? Um, I think they are still being paid by the CIA. And if they're not, who does end up paying these people? Because these people uh, are still there. There's still a, uh, an active uh, force for, for chaos. Maybe they get paid by the Taliban and they become part of the Taliban. Maybe they get paid by one of the Taliban's enemies and they continue in the uh, situation of, um, of, of, uh, just of, of uh, fighting against the Taliban. Who knows? But in any case, uh, it's certainly uh, a large piece of the puzzle on why the United States, when it did leave, left in such a hurry and left with so much pain and anguish um, at, uh, after this 20-year-long uh, debacle. When it comes to the Taliban's enemies and how they might relate to these mercenary forces that uh, the U.S. is keeping there, keep an eye out for the East Turkestan Islamic movement. It's been rising in this last year, this Uyghur terrorist nationalist organization that the US has recently started declining to classify as a terrorist organization for obvious reasons. They want to use it as a bludgeon for uh, wreaking terror upon China and continuing to destabilize Afghanistan. And uh, as I'm going to write about this week, I'm already seeing some efforts to manufacture consent for the supposed legitimacy of this terrorist group. Okay, that's, that's a, a good point that I had not considered, but uh, yeah, it's uh, very likely that in the long run, these forces, these guerrilla, these uh, uh, shadow army, uh, basically uh, 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 death squads, uh, will be pointed in the direction of um, the uh, uh, Uyghur uh, 
part of China and north north uh, western China and uh, against uh, Iran and uh, against Russia as well. So that's that's probably that's a, a real real good possibility. Fourth on the list tonight, mercenaries in the U.S. borders, <clears throat> in the U.S. borders, a sign of rapidly declining imp- empire by Rainer Shea. At the same time that this imperialist humiliation has been taking place, uh, these mercenary companies have been violating the civil liberties of the residents of Minneapolis, Minnesota, the same city, uh, fittingly, where George Floyd was murdered, where Winston Smith was murdered this summer. Uh, it's, it's been two companies. I think one of them is called Critical Response Group. Uh, and the, the other is, it goes by the acronym of CRG. Uh, you'll see the article to see what that one stands for. Uh, both of these have been patrolling these properties in ways that are deliberately provocative in ways that uh, lack any sort of de-escalation strategy in ways that uh, have involved heavily surveying the local population and uh, randomly arresting, arresting people with the complicity of the police. So it's, it's basically all bets are off on who these mercenaries arrest, who they track, who they target, who they profile. Uh, and it's clear that this is uh, part of the U.S. military's recently anticipated uh, strategy for, for bringing the wars home and that the U.S. military has expressed in uh, training videos and uh, documents from recent years that it is is going to need to uh, try to bring the yeah, Afghanistan, Iraq, etc. occupations home, and sending in the mercenaries is a good stepping stone towards this. Yeah, really. Um, it's it's. Uh... It, it's uh, an indication, I guess you'd say, of uh, the direction that the uh, U.S. is going in in the recent times, uh, a, a direction towards more fascistic police state tactics against its own uh, people. Um, it's an indication of the deepening of this, uh, the deepening of the uh, of of the uh, war on working class people at home. Um, the which which uh, they have gotten to the point now where there's not a lot of difference between being an American citizen and someone who's. Uh, a foreign citizen. They've done this to foreign citizens for decades and decades. They've done this this uh, brutal form of uh, attack, and basically attacking anyone, any any forces who stand up for socialism, any forces that stand up against American uh, invasion and occupation, and any of the uh, numerous, numerous, numerous countries. Something like more than sixty countries over the la- uh, over the last uh, half century that the United States has attacked, uh, invaded, uh, and occupied. And uh, they do this uh, on a constant basis. Now they're bringing the same tactics home. Uh, we're seeing it once again. Next on the list. Guerrilla warfare has key advantages over U.S. imperialism. Rainer Shea, take it away. Now, now observed that the reactionaries, the imperialists, are at the same time real tigers and 
paper tigers. On the one hand, they can deal great damage uh, in the form of, for example, the mercenary forces and proxy Uyghur terrorist forces they have in Afghanistan right now. But on the other, the imperialists have key weaknesses that have uh, resulted in them losing a lot of uh, the control that they would have wanted to have. The Taliban has been able to uh, defeat them uh, through the reality that the imperialists are detached from the masses. Uh, Washington uh, has learned, or at least history has attempted to make Washington learn that it cannot control entire countries uh, through sheer terror. That's not the way that human beings behave. That's not the way that sociology and anthropology works. Of course, the local masses in places like Afghanistan, Vietnam, and so on, are going to defy the uh, illegal foreign occupiers. Uh, evidently, even if it means uh, having to settle for a reactionary regime like the Taliban, that, that's, that's how much the imperialists have shot themselves in the foot in occupation attempts like these. And we're going to continue seeing this in places like, say, Colombia, where a branch of the FARC guerrillas has been uh, steadily, but uh, slowly steadily growing. It's been uh, gaining the perceived legitimacy of the masses it so far holds jurisdiction over. It's been winning some territory from the tyrannical neo-colonial settler capitalist regime in Colombia, uh, which parallel how the Houthis in Yemen have been able to defy the odds, defy the uh, great military superiority that the Saudi coalition has uh, by uh, pointing, simply pointing to the massive atrocities that the Saudi coalition is carrying out, the Saudi-Washington-Israeli coalition with their uh, perpetual plots to undermine the interests of the masses manufacture one of the world's greatest humanitarian crises in Yemen. And the Houthis have been able to leverage this uh, towards uh, striking an increasing number of victories. So this, this is the key weakness that the imperialists have up against the forces of guerrilla warfare. Uh, the very nature of the existence of an empire makes it inevitable that a great number of people are going to see them as illegitimate. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the uh, th this is an indicator of the uh, of, of the uh, weakening the uh, over time of the U.S. Uh, imperialist project worldwide. Uh, less and less people around the world buy into this project. Less and less people support it, and as a result, uh, more and, and also, of course, more and more people are uh, directly confronting it. And as a result, the U.S. Uh, imperialist project is uh, not as uh, strong as it once was. Um, and that's something that uh, we hope we can see a great deal of in the future, uh, a great um, a greater amount more in the future. Next on the list, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur propaganda mirrors NATO's Yugoslav narratives. This is by Rainer Shea. Uh, take it away, Rainer. The, obje the objective of the CIA operatives who carried out all of these psychological operations in, a in Yugoslavia throughout the 1990s, starting uh, from what I can tell, at least as early as 1991, was to scapegoat Serbia, to create the sense that the Serbs were to blame for all of the conflict, all the atrocities, all the ethnic tensions that were at play in this region and that uh, seemingly are, are still at play. 
uh, and a, the CIA, former CIA operative Robert Bayer uh, admitted to this in an interview in 2015. He confessed that the Serbs were their primary target for scapegoating for propaganda. Their goal was to paint the socialist government of Milosevic as a genocidal uh, fascist regime that needed to be overthrown in order for uh, the alleged uh, genocide against the Bosnians to end. And this so much parallels the narrative we're being fed about uh, Xinjiang and China right now, uh, which portrays the CPC, the Communist Party of China, as to blame for all of the uh, the tensions, all the unrest, all the terrorism within Central Eurasia. This is the narrative we're going to see be exploited to manufacture consent, as I said, for the East Turkestan Islamic movement and its terroristic operations, and directly in parallel to how they manufactured consent for the breakup of Yugoslavia, the, the dissolution of the last bastion of European socialism. However, in the case of China, the socialist state is too strong for the imperialist to realistically uh, destroy it through this balkanization model. But it, it is something to note. It is something to resist this, this narrative that the socialist state in question is committing uh, genocide. All right, next on the list and final, meet the U.S. government-backed regime change guru, Gene Sharp mastermind of soft coups by max blumenthal um in this uh article uh, uh appeared in uh the uh gray zone um august 17th uh max blumenthal discusses the u.s government-backed regime change guru Gene Sharp uh, with scholar Marcy Smith Parenti. Uh, they talked about Sharp's NED funded Albert Einstein Institution, his explicitly neoliberal pro corporate and pro imperialist politics, and, and uh, the manuals he wrote teaching people how to do so called color revolutions or soft coups against Washington's targets from Yugoslavia to uh, Venezuela to Hong Kong. Uh, and this has been going on for, uh, hell, Yugoslavia took place in the late 90s. <clears throat> and through, well, actually throughout the, throughout the 90s. So that's 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, this guy, he, uh, a lot of leftists uh, actually support this guy because he talks about uh, nonviolent change. Um, but his nonviolent change is a virulent form of anti communism, um, a virulent form of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, of uh, regime change against any socialist country. Uh, and there have been many that he has uh, helped to take down through his nonviolent uh, forms of uh, operation. Uh, you can read this article uh, at the Gray Zone. Uh, it's by Max Blumenthal, who's one of the two founders of the Gray Zone. Um, and uh, once again, it's entitled Meet the Strategist Behind the U.S. Regime Change Operations. Uh, meet U.S. government-backed regime change guru Gene Sharp. Well, Sharp died two years ago, uh, and um, he's been active for many, many years prior to that. Um, 
and uh he his his uh his his uh um anti communist anti soviet anti socialist anti people uh forms of nonviolent uh activism and protest uh continue on uh, without him. Uh, there's a couple of, actually another article that I want to, um, to bring to your attention that's uh, by Marthy, Marcy Smith. Um, and uh, it is uh, an article uh, in nonsite.org, May 10th, 2019. Um, called Change Agent, Gene Sharp's Neoliberal Violence, part one. Um, and she has a part two to go with it. But Gene Sharp, the Mach Machiavelli of nonviolence, has been fairly described as the most influential po American political figure you'll, you've never heard of. Sharp, who passed uh, away uh, in January 2018, was a beloved yet mysterious intellectual giant of nonviolent protest movements, and the father of the whole field of study of strategic nonviolent action. Over his career, he wrote more than 20 books about nonviolent action and social movements. His how-to pamphlets on nonviolent revolution from dictatorship to democracy has been translated to over 30 languages and is cited by protest movements around the world. In the US, his ideas are widely promoted through activist training programs and by scholars of nonviolence and have been used by nearly every major protest movement in the last 40 years. For those contributions, Sharp has been praised by progressive heavyweights like Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky, nominated for the Nobel Prize four times, compared to Gandhi, and cast as a lonely prophet of peace, champion of the downtrodden and friend of the left. Uh, Gene Sharp's influence on U.S. activists left in social movements abroad has been significant, but he is better understood as one of the most important U.S. defense intellectuals of the Cold War, an early neoliberal theorist concerned with supposedly inherent violence of, of the centralized states and quite uh, quiet, a quiet but vital counsel to, anti, uh, to anti-communist forces in, in the socialist world in the 1980s, from the 1980s onward. So she goes on talking about some of the more nefarious forms of uh, 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 the, the U.S. Uh, color revolution side of uh, Gene Sharp and how he helped to uh, carry out uh, color revolutions around the world. And these color revolutions, by the way, uh, sometimes they were nonviolent, but usually they were not. Uh, in fact, for example, in the uh, uh, color revolution in the uh, in um, uh, in in uh, uh, in um, <clears throat> Uh, the Ukraine in 19 in uh, 2014, um, the, uh, the tactics that the CIA employed as part of Gene Sharp's color revolution, uh, color revolution um, uh, uh, playbook, uh, included having sharpshooters on the. Uh, the uh, rooftops of high rises overlooking uh, the uh, overlooking the uh, 
um, uh, Maidan, uh, um, the, the Maidan uh, uh, protests and uh, randomly shooting into the crowds. And then, of course, later on, blaming this on uh, the uh, Ukrainian police forces uh, instead of where it really belonged, which was on the CIA. Um, that's an example. And uh, that's not just some, you know, wild ass, uh, wild ass claim that I make. That is uh, well established by now that the CIA was at the center of these uh, shootings from above. Uh, and they didn't care whether they shot their own people or the other side. Uh, they did it uh, as a way to bl then blame the, uh, the uh, Ukrainian state for these kinds of actions. And it was part of the reason that the Ukrainian state ended up falling in 2014 to these nonviolent forces that uh, Gene Sharp uh, pushes. So there you have it, at least some of the, uh, of the uh, sides of change agent Gene Sharp, neoliberal violence. Yes, uh, there's there's a, quite a lot of contradictions to be found in these these kinds of social movements that Gene Sharp has helped foment. Like for instance, the movement to take down the Soviet Union. There was in fact quite a lot of violence uh, to the level of the the military getting involved. There was the there was so much. Uh, bloodshed and property destruction entailed in that uh, that transition of power. It was not some peaceful thing. Uh, and that, that's because uh, when, and that's because when you try to uh, take down a socialist government, then a lot of people are inevitably going to get hurt, not just with bloodshed, but in terms of their lifestyles. The fall of the Soviet bloc was uh, one of the 20th century's uh, greatest losses for the, the living standards of the, the working class globally. Uh, so many people lost their, uh, their lifestyles, uh, their, the opportunities that they had had. And it, it's, it's really incredible how the, this idea that created this roll back for working class gains in the Soviet bloc is essentially has essentially been replicated within the groupthink of the mainstream US left. Yeah. Uh, very well put. Okay, that's it for us for tonight. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Rainer, for the great contribution you always make. Uh, thank the audience, the uh, listeners and viewers of Revolutionary Socialist Review for tuning in. And please tune in again next week when we'll bring you another episode of Revolutionary Socialist Review. Until then, I bid you a sweet adieu.